many of you are like me, very, very interested in the in shadow work, and um, I thought it might be fascinating to look at actually a specific example of Carl Jung, who originated the term shadow work. An example of him actually doing shadow work on himself, doing shadow work on himself with very great effect. They were worried at one point that he might have epilepsy when he was about twelve years old. His parents were very worried about him, but he discovered the cause and the cure himself. Let's get into it. So although mostly Jung did very well as a pupil at school, he had very mixed feelings about it. In some ways he found it really boring and sometimes terrifying, like when it came to mathematics. But at the same time he was very interested in exploring things and learning things. And But he had this sense of trepidation, of weariness about wanting to explore the world, but having been very wary of the threats and the dangers in the world, and they can feel this conflict inside themselves. So Jung also mentions about his childhood that, that people would react against him. He often felt like an outsider, ostracized, and the trouble sort of getting on with people. And I, I suspect that's probably because he was such an intense character. He really wanted to get to the depth of things and the meaning of things um, even when he was relatively young, even when he was a young boy, he had a very intense inner life. And so that made him feel different from everybody else. So he felt different and he probably acted differently. And he noticed that some of his teachers took a dislike to him. And it's maybe because he was really bright. Maybe he threatened them. The Jung doesn't put it that way, but that could have been part of it. Because he seems like he was the kind of person who really studied a topic intensely and broadly. And he may, in some cases, actually known more than the teacher did. <laughs> and the teacher was threatened by it. That teacher would try and put him down first chance that they got. You know, put him in his place type of attitude. That was the background to this story from his, um, his biography that really became an autobiography of memories, dreams and reflections. My twelfth year was indeed a fateful one for me. One day in the early summer of 1887, I was standing in the cathedral square waiting for a classmate who went home by the same route as myself. It was 12 o'clock and the morning classes were over. Suddenly, another boy gave me a shove that knocked me off my feet. I fell, striking my head against the curbstone so hard that I almost lost consciousness. For about half an hour afterwards, I was a little dazed. At the moment that I felt the blow, my thought flashed through my mind. Now you won't have to go to school anymore. I was only half unconscious, but I remained lying there a few moments longer than was strictly necessary, chiefly in order to avenge myself on my assailant. Then people picked me up and took me to a house nearby, where two elderly spinster aunts lived. From then on I began to have fainting spells whenever I had to return to school, and whenever my parents set me to doing my homework. For more than six months I stayed away from school, and for me that was a picnic. I was free, could dream for hours, be anywhere I liked, in the woods or by the water, or draw. I resumed my battle pictures and furious scenes of war, of old castles that were being assaulted or burned, or drew page upon page of caricatures. Similar caricatures sometimes appeared to me before falling asleep to this day grinning masks that constantly move and change among the familiar faces of people who soon afterwards died. Above all, I was able to plunge into the world of the mysterious. To that realm belongs trees, a pool, the swamp, stones and animals, and my father's library. But I was growing more and more away from the world, and had all the while faint pangs of conscience. I frittered away my time with loafing, collecting, reading and playing, but I did not feel any happier for it. I had the obscure feeling that I was fleeing from myself. I forgot completely how all this had come about, but I pitied my parents' worries. They consulted various doctors who scratched their heads and packed me off to spend the holidays with relatives in Winterthur. This city had a railroad station that proved a source of endless delights to me. But when I returned home, everything was as before. One doctor thought I had epilepsy. I knew what epileptic fits were like and inwardly laughed at such nonsense. My parents became more worried than ever. Then one day a friend called on my father. They were sitting in the garden and I hid behind a shrub, for I was possessed of an insatiable curiosity. I heard the visitor saying to my father, And how is your son? 
Ah, that's a sad business, my father replied. The doctors no longer know what is wrong with him. They think it may be epilepsy. It would be dreadful if he were incurable. I have lost what little I had, meaning what money he had. And what will become of the boy if he cannot earn his own living? I was thunderstruck. This was the collision of reality. Why, then, I must get to work, I thought suddenly. From that moment on, I became a serious child. I crept away, went to my father's study, took out my Latin grammar, and began to cram with intense concentration. After ten minutes of this, I had the finest of fainting fits. I almost fell off the chair, but after a few minutes I felt better and went on working. Devil take it, I'm not going to faint, I told myself, and persisted in my purpose. But this time it took about fifteen minutes before the second attack came. This too passed like the first. And now you must really get to work, I told myself. I stuck it out and after an hour the third attack came. Still I did not give up and worked for another hour until I had the feeling that I had overcome the attacks. Suddenly I felt better than I had at all the months before. And in fact the attacks did not recur. From that day on I worked over my grammar and other school books every day. A few weeks later I returned to school and never suffered another attack even there. This whole bag of tricks was over and done with. That is when I learned what a neurosis is. As you may know, neurosis means divided against yourself, and that can create psychological or even physical symptoms. Gradually, the recollection of how it had all come about returned to me. I saw clearly that I myself had arranged the whole disgraceful situation. That is why I had never been seriously angry with a schoolmate who pushed me over. I knew that he had been put up to it, so to speak, and that the whole affair was a diabolical plot on my part. I knew too that this was never going to happen to me again. I had a feeling of rage against myself and at the same time was ashamed of myself. For I knew that I had wronged myself and made a fool of myself in my own eyes. Nobody else was to blame. I was the cursed renegade. From then on I could no longer endure my parents worrying about me or speaking of me in a pitying tone. Now I find this fascinating because it's showing some very strong characteristics in Jung of of self-honesty and being willing to really look at how did I cause this situation? And a level of, of depth of self-honesty, an intense sense of integrity that emerged and caused him to feel a strong sense of guilt and shame and a certain amount of self-blame and you know the, the other things he said around it becomes obvious that he really felt ashamed, he felt really ashamed of himself because he he caused his parents a lot of worry and suffering and he felt he was being cowardly by not really engaging with the world. He was withdrawing from the world and he was causing suffering to others by it. Uh, that was causing a deep conflict within him. And this was playing out in bodily symptoms of fainting at convenient times. <laughs> so it shows an interesting principle of noticing, well, we've got a symptom. How convenient is it? What, what does it let us get away with? <laughs> is it enabling us to get away from doing something that we don't want to do anyway, or part of us is resisting, and at the same time part of us is push, pushing us, go, go engage with life. Also, the symptoms he was having went, also went the other way, I enabled him to do things that he, part of him really wanted to do, which was escape. <laughs> but the deeper, wiser part of him knew he needed to engage with life. And I guess ultimately he, he did both because he engaged with life but also he, he was able to cultivate the, the dreaming, escaping part of himself. The, his, he was able to cultivate his inner life, his inner world in a way that really served people. After he had really allowed himself to engage with life and to um, and take responsibility for the life he had and the effects he was having on other people, especially his very worried parents who were short of money and couldn't really afford these expensive specialists and all of that they were having to send them to. An important thing about this is that is this kind of shadow work is, and the principles of how to do shadow work is that Jung seized upon a purpose, a goal, a benefit, uh, some real tangible benefit that he would get from curing himself. He, he had a reason to get better, a very strong reason to get better and that related to the real world and his future life. Um, he didn't want to spend the rest of his life in struggling in poverty and he wanted to make something of himself 
So he was able to feel motivated to get better. So that gave him the drive and the energy to move forward. And I often work with that when I'm doing forgiveness work. I help people find the motive of why they want to forgive. Finding a good motive for wanting to forgive really helps drive the forgiveness process forward. Uh, and it's a similar shadow work. Having a, a motive for moving forward with the shadow work really helps us to heal ourselves. And it needs to be uh, something that really is meaningful that we can really relate to, not some kind of made up thing that we should feel that we ought to relate to, but something we really can relate to. And he could really relate to not being poor. And he could also really relate to um, the suffering that his parents were going through. So he had some strong incentives to get better. And it was also interesting that he, he faced the issue head on. Once he had an insight and his will got engaged, I really need to do something about this. He really went for it. He took the actions and then he had deeper and deeper insights to the causes. As he had insights to the causes, that fortified his will and his, and his purpose of overcoming this neurosis, as he called it, by facing it head on. So I think this is a very powerful example of shadow work. Very intriguing one. It's quite, quite, a, quite an amazing story, especially when you consider, as I say, that he was only 12 years old when he was doing all of this. So he was obviously natural in the field of psychology. I find in my own life that sometimes dynamic qualities are what is needed to cure certain ailments or certain psychological dispositions. And, and sometimes boldness and courage are, are essential parts of the healing process. Don't necessarily all need to do it the way Jung did it by charging right in and <laughs> going for it. Maybe we need more time to cultivate those qualities. But Jung was responding to an overly timid part of his nature that was causing him to withdraw from life too much in a way that was unbalanced and unhealthy. And by really going for the opposite qualities, basically it seemed to me he engaged boldness and courage, really engaged with life, and that produced a very successful result of healing him of the ailment. And that's what he needed was the qualities of boldness and courage and to engage with that and express those. And that his, his reflective analytical part was um, not what was the issue. He was become one-sided, as he might describe in his own character, and he was too much in the, in the reflective, uh, inward-looking part of himself and not enough engaged in the outgoing part of himself. So he needed to be able to switch between those two. And that, that was an opportunity which stood him in great stead the rest of his life, being able to boldly, courageously move ahead and engage with life, because he needed that a lot. Or he would have never, um, it would have never even got into the field of psychology because it was not a particularly respectable field when he got into it. So he needed to make choices in his life later when he, when he needed boldness and courage dealing with his inner processes and dealing with outer life. He would have never been, become the person that he became if he hadn't been willing to engage with boldness and courage, as well as being reflective and inward looking. He had to have the outward going qualities as well as the inward going qualities. So he had to find his own balance around those. And often that's the case that when we do shadow work, that we, we gain the gifts and the gifts are those qualities that are as good as gold for the rest of our life. We gain abilities and qualities that are otherwise wrapped up in the, the shadow. Anyway, hope you find this useful and beneficial. <laughs> be you, be your best, be your best self. You're awesome. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs>